In this episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, we have a couple of heavyweights from AMD, some prize fighters in the gaming arena getting ready to throw down. Next. Welcome back to yet another fine episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks webcast. I'm Dave Altavilla here, always with my compatriot, the ever fabulous Marco Ciupetta. How you doing, buddy? I'm surviving, baby. It's been a busy <laughs> few days. <laughs> <laughs> Long on work, short on sleep. Chris Gettings behind the dials as well. Thanks for helping us out with that, Chris. And with us are two very special guests, the illustrious frank azor and scott herkelman from amd we've got the um the grand poobar of all things gaming and the guy that is radion at amd how's that sound guys for titles can we can we tweak your official titles is that okay <laughs> of course of course no problem nice to be here thanks for inviting us yeah um, thanks for having us it's good to see you guys and you as well thanks for joining us on this uh fine day your your big um announcement and uh, big launch of the radeon uh, rx 6800 6800 xt uh and um, good to have important folks like you that were behind all of this new technology that was launched by your company today that um as we um coined it uh, at hot hardware and, and other places as well um brings you back squarely firmly into the high end of uh high-end gaming gpus uh versus your competition nvidia and uh we were uh thoroughly impressed with what we saw i guess you know i'll sort of without getting you know too quickly into the meat of of the uh the questioning here um i'll i'll say i'll just ask you know sort of a softball for you before we turn the wolves on um how does it feel to have amd back and very competitive in the high end um with products that um, clearly are going to um, light up some pixels across many gaming screens for enthusiasts uh, around the world. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, first, it's an exciting time. We've been looking forward to this day for many years. You, as you know, it takes a while to develop some a new GPU architecture and timing it with the console launches was a strategic importance for us. So we've been looking forward to this for a long time. Our engineers today should feel very proud because they produce an absolutely phenomenal GPU. And by the way, I've read many, many reviews. I think they've all been very fair. And um, we're, we're very excited about the results of our brand new architecture. I think it's going to just improve over time. I think it'll, like we always do, we find mm -hmm. new optimizations, find new techniques. And um, we're back in the high end and we're going to be competitive in the high end. And I think you're going to see a lot more out of the Radeon group over the next year or so. Yeah, and in, and in, thank you, Scott. That's uh, it, it agreed. Sounds exciting. By the way, in case you didn't notice, Scott is CVP and GM of the Radeon Graphics Business Unit at AMD. In case you didn't know, that's the official title. Frank Azor is here. He's Chief Gaming Architect, Chief Gaming Architect of Solutions at AMD. Um, I'm trying to develop the longest title in the world for a person <laughs> at AMD. <laughs> but but you can see we we developed these nice lower thirds for you with along with Radeon Red. So. Um, yeah, how's it how's it feel for you, Frank? Um, good to have some more tools in your gaming arsenal to to work with. Yeah, you know, I, I came to AMD last July in 2019, and I've witnessed what Scott and his engineering team, uh, the RTG engineering team, the business team, the marketing teams have gone through um, since I joined, at least. And a lot of this work, you know, predates me joining. The sacrifice, the long hours, the long calls, the discussions, the debates, the, the hard decisions. It's moments like today when you finally see the result of all of that work come together that I'm, I'm extremely proud of this team because I've seen them go through that hard work, through that pain and suffering. It is, you know, I thought bringing a computer to market, which I've done for 20 years in my, in, in my prior life, was really hard. This is at a different level. Of <laughs> complexity, bringing these, uh, bringing a graphics card to market, and I'm just, I'm really proud for them. I hope they're really enjoying the moment. Everybody back at AMD is enjoying it because this is a, it's a remarkable feat. It's really, really remarkable, and we still have plenty of challenges ahead. Um, there's still a ton of opportunity, but today's a day of celebration for for most people. Amen. Yeah, good stuff. I think uh, consumers everywhere are gaming consumers, PC gaming consumers are celebrating because there is uh, there's a lot more choice in the high end now and a competitive 
high-end graphics uh, arena is always great for consumers. Marco, you spent some quality time with this product. I did as well. I kicked the tires on the high-end card, the 6800 XT. Um, first impressions, and then we can uh, start peppering these guys. You want to want to go that route? Yeah, first impression is <laughs> it, it can't can't be anything but positive. So you know, the 6800 did everything uh, AMD said it was going to do. Competed really well with the uh, 20, 2080 Ti, and you know, by extension, the 3070. And the 6800 XT traded blows with the 3080. It's a, you know exactly what was presented a few weeks ago. So and you know, and in terms of just the the overall feel and the impression the cards give, like, let me just this is the 6800. Let me just hold it up for a second here. Um, yeah, I don't mean to be, I'm not putting down any previous gen cards, but just feeling this card and getting it in hand and unboxing it, it, it was clear that AMD put a lot more effort into the design of the 6800 series than perhaps some of the previous gen. So yeah, positive all around for me. Hey, Mark, Marco, you don't, you don't have to hold back. I think it was this time last year when we were talking about blowers, we were talking about <laughs> dents. Um, and I think that we took your feedback, the community's feedback on this, you know, we, I think it was this time last year, we had that same podcast and, um, you know, we put a lot of effort into the, the thermal design, the, the acoustics, the temperature, uh, not a blower, no dents, uh, something that, you know, enthusiasts would be proud to have in their PC. So we want to thank you and your community for all of that feedback you gave us like last year to truly produce something that we think the enthusiasts will enjoy and love. And I, I think they will, you know, just that this is not, I, I'm going to throw an off the cup question before Dave, um, before Dave jumps in, because something just, just dawned on me, you know, looking at this card versus some of compete, some of the competing cards and what board partners do. Do you guys take into consideration the board partners when you're designing your, your reference solution? You know, do you perhaps hold back a little bit so board partners can do some of their own special sauce or, you know, is this AMD's vision for the 6800 and the 6800 XT? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Actually, there, there are things we do work with our AIB partners on that they have some unique things that they want to do. And when they ask us that, we just work with them on validating that that would work and it will fit within our specifications. Um, but there's always things that they bring to us. They're very innovative. A lot of our AIB partners are, are some really strong AIB partners with engineering departments that do cool things. Um, but we definitely put a tremendous amount of effort in our own design and we hand that to them as an option for them to choose. Um, and we you know, work with them on bringing it up procuring materials, making sure it passes all the, the testing methodologies that we want to have a good, high quality and reliable product. But um, it's a little bit of a handshake between us where we're innovating together. And we, you know, if, if they want to use this reference design, of course they can. Um, but at the same time, a lot of them want to have their own unique designs and, and we fully support them when they want to do that. Good stuff. Good stuff. What what are your, what are your goals moving forward? And this is again, a little bit on the softy side of a question but what are your goals moving forward i guess is is the initial uh, uh you know thought out of the gate you know once that we've we've seen the these three cards announced now the 6800 600 xt uh 6900 xt forthcoming in december what does the road ahead look like in terms of how you're going to go at it in the market versus nvidia and i guess you know sort of best intentions to kind of uh, you know is it complete world domination or <laughs> <laughs> or uh, or what are we what are we looking at here moving forward? Do you think? Well, well, Nvidia is a uh, very strong competitor. I, I don't think any, there's any doubt about that. So complete world domination, uh, it, it's going to be a fight. But what I would <laughs> say is that um, uh, our roadmap is is very solid, and I think we even showed that in our launch materials. If you had a chance to check that out, um, but our commitment is going to be tops down roadmap consistency. Be there in, for the enthusiasts in that category. Offer them a choice. Um, bring our best technologies out to bear. And um, one thing that I'm very excited about is something that only AMD is doing recently, which is combining our CPU and GPU technology together and offering even more value. Um, there's no one in the world that can do that today. And so that is a key pillar to our future strategy is bringing our engineering teams together, innovation, um, whether it's in hardware innovation between CPU and GPUs or software innovation, uh, and I think that you're going to see a lot more out of a, out, out of us as a as a company here over the next couple of years in that space. You know, just combining our engineering efforts and making even the best PC platform that we can. Um, from the GPU side, we're going to be consistent. We're going to execute. I think in, in Radeon's past, we've we've had a little bit of holes in our roadmap. I think we can all just openly say that that uh, Nvidia has enjoyed the enthusiast category uh, in the past quite uh, easily. 
and uh, we're bringing the fight to them. And I think the uh, RDNA2 architecture is a, a really great architecture. Uh, you know, if you think about it, we we launched RDNA1 or RDNA 16 months ago, and our engineers were able to turn around in, in a couple of years and during a, a COVID 2020 year, uh, produce a brand new architecture that as absolutely competes with their high end. And, and I'm very proud of them for that. And that's what you should expect out of us going forward is consistency, execution, complete coverage for the enthusiasts all the way down to the mainstream going forward. And, and that's what we're excited about and we're going to execute towards. Nice. I know, Frank, you have um, quite a bit of an opinion on the platform side of things and agreed, Scott, uniquely positioned currently with CPU and GPU technology. Frank, uh, any thoughts on, on that side of the house? Yeah, it's what, what I one of the key things I came to AMD to do is I've, I've been building solutions, right? The entire product, um, my entire career. And uh, as I saw what AMD had coming down the roadmap, um, obviously on the CPU side, and now what we see coming down on the graphics side, the op number of opportunities that came to my mind for how we could combine these things to, to really build just an overall better solution above and beyond all the innovation that I've uh, been able to deliver in the past with my teams and my prior life, it, there's so many ideas came to mind, so many different opportunities came to mind. And we're just at the forefront of that. You know, we did Smart Shift um, earlier this year for notebooks. Uh, we introduced Smart Access Memory here for um, uh, for the Ryzen 5000 series and the Radeon RX 6000 series. And there's just so many other opportunities for us to combine these components and the rest of the IP and technology portfolio that we have at AMD to move gaming forward, to really leaps and bounds, improve performance, and uh, introduce new experiences. So. It's a really exciting time. We have a long runway ahead of us of opportunities. Um, so we're just getting started. Yeah, there you go. Good to hear that. Good to hear you just getting warmed up. Um, Marco, I know we've got a bunch of uh, questions in the chat. I'm going to turn the, the question reins over to you. Do you want to do you want to field a tech epiphany or should we or do we have one before that? Um, well, I'm just going to do a quick general um, answer. If you're asking about future product, like we had a question yeah, about yeah. the 6700, there's no possible way we're going to get an answer today. Um, if you look at history, every GPU company launches a new architecture and it eventually permeates up and down the stack. Um, so you, yes, you can expect our DNA two to come to other cards when we're not going to find out on this uh, particular podcast, obviously. Um, I think should we should we address the elephant in the room because the natives are restless. What do you think? Do that yeah, first. Yeah, we 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 can address that and uh, and then on the back of that, I think Tech Epiphany uh, with a super chat question has a has a pretty good question on uh, AIB partner cards as well. So yeah, fire right, away. So, <laughs> yep. So so um, Tech Epiphany asked, happy to see you back in the high end. Uh, why were AIBs and therefore general supply artificially delayed? Assuming that's correct, will our DNA one stay around in the mid range? Okay, let me uh, take the second question first. Okay, um, RDNA will stay in the mid range uh, for a period of time until we're we're ready to replace it. Um, I can't give any more details than that, but <laughs> it's still an ongoing skew, and it's a fantastic performer in that price point point range. And I think you should buy it. Um, in terms of the, the first question was AIBs, right? When will they? Uh, what what about their designs? Is that is that what the question was, Marco? Um, yeah, I just I just scrolled past it. So he he mentions, and this may not be correct. He says, um, so the the specific question was, why were AIBs and therefore general supply artificially delayed? Um, AIBs, uh, we always launch our MBA designs first, our reference designs. It allows us to uh, put everything through manufacturing, do validation, um, and put out a reference design that we believe will be um, a, a gold standard for performance. Um, our AIBs are right behind us. Um, I'm going to let them announce their own dates for shelf. Some are running faster than others, but you won't have to wait long for their supply. And what you'll see is that um, as of right now, you know, we've been shipping on a daily basis for several weeks now to them, um, our own ASICs. So that way they could build their own designs, get them out to the market, make sure that there's ample supply, hopefully enough supply for everyone. Um, I would, I'll, I'll say the demand lately has been just absolutely crazy in the gaming industry. I'm not sure that um, day one that we're going to meet everybody's uh, available or, or wanting to purchase. But I think over time throughout the rest of, uh, you know, November and December, you'll see us continue to bring more and more products every day to the shelf and give consumers the opportunity to buy it. And then our AIB's uh, supply is just right around the corner. It's just 
I, I can't say when. It's up to them to tell when they're going to hit store shelves. But I think you'll see even their their stock uh, start to improve here over the next few weeks uh, to, to months as they start hitting their own store shelves. Cool. A anything else to add on that, Marco? <laughs> well, I was going to say, so in terms of, in, well, no, because in, in terms of general availability, obviously the trolls have come out. There must be some sort of chat going on somewhere that uh, brought some of the trolls into our chat. And it's, it's you know, every other comment is about availability. I'm sure some of these people don't understand what supply and demand is, but there is probably, you know, some sort of st strategy at play here as well. You know, can Scott or Frank, can you guys talk about... Um, I'm not, I know you can't give numbers, but can you talk about general availability, what the plan was coming in to try to mitigate what, what happened today where cards kind of sold out immediately? Um, I could give you a little bit of commentary about that, which is um, it takes roughly four or five months by the time you work with the fabs to get a product to the market. And so um, as we saw our console consoles uh, partners uh, go through their pre-orders, then we saw our competitors go through theirs. I think we reacted quickly to try to bring in as much product as we could. And I, I do believe we have pretty good supply worldwide. Um, for this type of market in the upper enthusiast category, if you look historically, there is there is a certain amount of units that are sold every year, You know, historically 100% owned by NVIDIA uh, because we were not in that space. Um, we, we projected for a pretty good share uh, growth in this category as we launched this product. Um, but what we've seen today so far is we sold out pretty quickly of all that demand. I think if you look through the rest of this year, um, every day we've been shipping and we'll continue to ship. We're going to be bringing more products to the market and our availability will get better as the year uh, comes to a close and then through next early next year. So we're shipping every day. That, that's, that's really the only comment and commitment I can make is uh, we're shipping good amounts. Uh, we're hoping to get even more stock. We're trying to pull in supply. It's in our best interest. And by the way, as a gamer, I want you to have my product. There, I, there's no way I want to hold back any supply from you. Uh, we're accelerating it. We want you to have it. We uh, we know you want it. And uh, it, our goal is to get you that product. It's in, our, it's in our best interest to get you that product as well. I mean, that jibes with me as well. And I'll just throw in a commentary here. I mean, I'm sorry, you know, at a very bare minimum, the, the more cards you ship, the fewer cards the other guys ship and vice versa. That's kind of, you know, it's physics almost. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, I, I would, uh, I would concur that that would be likely be the case, Scott. Um, uh, we, we have a couple more questions on that front. Maybe do we Marco, or should we move on from, from the topic of availability? We should do, we should do a read mean tweets section. On that. Yeah. <laughs> In my opinion, <laughs> can we do that for fun? <laughs> why, why, don't, why don't we just hit you with a paddle, Frank? You, oh, God. <laughs> you know what? I have a question that's another one I'm going to do off the cuff because I find it really interesting. Um, we'll come back to some of the chats in just a second. Yeah. You know, looking back through the numbers and the performance, you guys started building this chip a few years ago. Uh, NVIDIA started building theirs a few years ago as well. And you both kind of came out on the other end with products that perform roughly r roughly the same i'm not gonna say you, you know you guys are, are exactly the same but how does that stuff shake out is there some inside baseball going on are you limited by manufacturing capabilities it's just it, it's got to be more than coincidence that at, at, at this you know at this point the cards are performing similarly can you give some insight into that uh, I think I'll give you some generic insight. I think that, I um, mean, you, you should ask the same to them, uh, by the way, and get their opinion on it. But what, from our perspective, it's physics. Um, you know, depending upon what manufacturing node you're in and how many transistors you can pack in there and then how you arrange all the widgets and how you connect all the widgets together and how you optimize for those and the data flows and the paths inside the chip. Um, there's a certain amount of physics that, you know, would tell you the performance range is going to be between X and Y. And so I think that's why you see some variation between where they're at and where we're, where we are. Um, and then, you know, obviously we have some different techniques that we employed in uh, RDNA 2 for the PC space, including our Infinity Cache. Um, there's some really cool things that we've done uh, differently than they have, which has allowed us to put out more performance with less power. So there are some, some things that uh, you can do differently, but most of the performance ranges do come down to what you can manufacture in the time period when you build a new architecture. So you plan these things years out in advance, under, you know, working with your fab partners to say, hey, what can we build? What can, you know, how many transistors can you put in there? Okay, now that I can put that in there, how many, how many CUs can I put in there? And then what's that cost? And then how, what kind of die size should I build in order to achieve that performance? Um, and then what's the timeline to get all that produced? Uh, and then you say, you know, what else can we do that's unique that we know that nobody else maybe can 
can do right now or that maybe no one else is thinking of. And that's where like things like Infinity Cash for us uh, came about. You know, we brought some really smart experts over from the CPU team over to the GPU team a couple of years ago, and they've been working with us ever since to work with us on frequency, to work with, with us on performance per watt. And um, that's where the idea for Infinity Cash came in, which is putting that cash on, on die allowing us to achieve more performance at less power. So there are some things that you could do, even if uh, fabs are at a certain level, to, to tweak your architecture, to tweak your performance. Um, and then as you know, there's a lot of things you can do in software to even do uh, better things or different things than your competitors. Hopefully that answers your question, Marco. Yeah. yeah. And in, in terms of you know capacity, I mean, your, your fab partners right now are absolutely lit up. Um, you've got, PlayStation 5, you've got Xbox Series X, and now, of course, you know, Big Navi coming through the, the fab pipes. So, I mean, you are, you're pushing a lot of silicon volume, I would imagine. And, and don't forget, we have Ryzen 5000 series as well. <laughs> yes, yes, I left out the CPUs, of it's course. Kind of a, it's kind of an epic <laughs> moment in silicon history, if you think about it, um, this, Q, this Q4, with all these high-performance gaming devices converging at the same time. Uh, it's, it's an yeah. interesting time. Agreed. Agreed. We did have a question that was uh, interesting, and then we should probably dive into some architecture and, and Infinity Cash a little bit as well. Um, in the chat, um, can you please ask how many rasterizers uh, Navi 21 has? In the architecture slide, you see only four, but if you check the Linux driver, it should be eight. I'm not sure if you can feel that or not, Scott. But um, uh, we would, well, we can get back to you with that answer. I'm not sure. I didn't. I wasn't. Uh, I don't have that here with me. But we can we can double click on that for you, and you can post it if you'd like to, Dave. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, all right, Marco. Um, so let's let's get into um, uh, let's get into smart access memory and Infinity Cache for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So there's there's some confusion around a, a PCI Express uh, spec called resizable bar and smart uh, smart access memory. Can you guys explain sort of what AMD did differently than what the spec calls for, if there is anything different? You want me to take that, Scott? Yeah, sure, Frank. Okay. Um, so smart access memory leverages uh, the re the rebar, as you call the re, re uh, base address registry, um, resizable base address registry technology. But it's not a one to one. It's not like smart access memory and rebar are one to one. In if you just turn it on, suddenly everything just works perfectly. Uh, the teams had to do a fair amount of BIOS work, firmware work. Um, and different implementation methodologies to be able to get the kind of performance that we're getting out of it uh, and to solve several bugs that we encountered along the way. So while the rebar implementation um, uh, is part of the PCI specification, other companies will be able to take advantage of that as well. It is completely open, but how they implement it, um, what, uh, what software they exactly write to implement it, how they tune it, how they solved some of the issues that we encountered that they're uh, absolutely going to encounter themselves. That's what makes our implementation of it unique. Um, and we're open to actually collaborating with uh, our competitors to help them enable this because it is a, a great performance story. Um, and, you know, it's not necessarily years of work that had to go into this to be able to make it happen. It's actually something that's um, pretty, a pretty nice opportunity for the industry to be able to capitalize on. But it's not as simple as you just flick a switch for rebar and suddenly you get smart access memory. There's there's a little bit more to that. Got it. So we cool. have another super chat from Tech Epiphany with a whole bunch yeah. of questions. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming some of these you can answer and some you can't, but I'm going to throw them all at you anyway. Cool. So uh, Tech Epiphany is asking, can we expect driver updates for GCN for, for some more years? And can Infinity Scat Cache scale down to lower end, you know, e.g. APUs? And why no uh, HBCC put into our DNA? It seems to help Vega. Uh, for the answer, for the question for GCN, yes. So, uh, we will continue to support our older products with driver updates and optimizations and, and bug fixes. If there are bug fixes or when bug fixes happen or end user issues, we'll continue to support that architecture. Actually. Um, if you if you noticed our roadmap, we've uh, we've we pivoted a little bit for our compute and our data center. We continue to use the GCN for data center uh, workloads, and so we'll also continue to support gaming workloads uh, with our driver updates in the future. So the, yes, that is a commitment we can make, 
And then your second question, Marco, there was, I think. So three. the second one he was asking about infinity cash scaling down to lower end products. Is, is, yeah. Does it make sense to go smaller? Um, uh, we're not announcing anything at this time, but there is there is technically the capability to make uh, 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 an infinity cash in a different size and configurations. Gotcha. One of the things we noticed on infinity cash that um, Marco and I were kind of chewing through the numbers on uh, last night, um, your you have a 256 bit memory interface on um, RX 6800 series in general, um, and and specifically in the XT interfacing to 16 gigs of GDDR6, where versus a 3080, for example, <clears throat> you've got a 320 bit memory interface interfacing to higher speed GDDR6X, uh, PAM4 signaling, higher bandwidth, really, not necessarily higher speed. Anyways, long story short, your cards are trading blows versus a wider memory bus and a, um, a higher bandwidth uh, GDDR6 memory. Infinity Cache responsible for that parity and just a different way of, uh, you know, optimizing the architecture, right? Is that that's kind of, you know, the the takeaway we had. Yeah, you know, you're, you're exactly right. And that's exactly what the Infinity Cache does. Um, uh, it allows us to use a, a lower bit uh, rate memory bus and um, leverage that Infinity Cache on die. So it reduces latency um, and, and also reduces power. You know, I think the, the downside of uh, maybe a GDDR6X spec is that it does, uh, you know, probably produce more power uh, on the chip or on your board. So there are some things that we're able to do uniquely with Infinity Cache that reduces latency, increases performance because you have a little bit more cash on the die, but at the same time, um, there, there's some really nice effects on power that that, uh, that that cash provided for us. And that's why you see us have, have a little bit of a lead this generation in terms of power and perf per watt, if you will. I, I think it'll be critical for um, notebooks in the future, you know, as you think about thin and light notebooks and um, uh, the platforms that we want to build with our OEM partners, you know, we're able to provide some, some pretty nice performance and performance per watt numbers that uh, we're excited for our OEM partners to to get their hands on these chips and see what they could do with it in a notebook form factor. Cool. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. What else we got, Marco? Um, just quick, just the third part to that question I'm about the high bandwidth cache controller that was in Vega. Is Does Infinity Cache sort of negate the need for that? Was it just a, a architecture change? Yeah, that, that's right. So yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for following up with that question. Yeah, we just chose that uh, the Infinity Cache was a bigger investment for us this time. You know, and I know in Vega we had HPCC, um, and it was good for for Vega and GCN that worked really nicely. But this generation of RDNA two, you know, we we chose to invest in the Infinity Cache. Not that it couldn't be done. I mean, we could have applied it to RDNA two, but uh, we believe that the Infinity Cache allowed us to accomplish what our our product goals were for for gaming in this segment. Got it. Yeah. So um, Hertz is asking the same question as before. Hertz, we asked Scott the question and he's going to get back to us. We will post it when we get that. Um, so I don't want you to think we're ignoring your super chat, but we already asked earlier. You may have missed Scott's response on that one. Um, the chat is going by super quick. So I am going to just ask a question for myself because I can't keep up with everything that's flying by. <laughs> I've got a bunch. So looking, looking through the performance. Um, you know, traditional rasterization performance, obviously very strong, you know, competes very well with uh, with, you know, the competitions cards. Um, ray tracing, not not quite as good as a comparison. Um, any thoughts on how that might evolve with drivers over time? Is there potential for improvements with existing titles or is, you know, what we saw today kind of what we got? Uh, no, I think it will improve over time. I think that we're just beginning our hardware uh, acceleration of ray tracing. Um, I think if you look over the last two years, you, we have to give kudos to our competition for coming out earlier than us with hardware accelerated ray tracing in their GPUs. And so if you're a game developer, that's all you could basically code for uh, was, was NVIDIA. And now that we have our, our consoles that are in the market, and now that we have our, our hardware in the market and enthusiast space, I think from here on out, it's uh, it, it'll be fair game to optimize for new titles and improve our ray tracing performance. And so uh, I think it'll it'll definitely improve over time. I think as more games launch that um, are cross-platform, you'll see some unique opportunities for the Radeon Group and uh, AMD to, to really push the performance level uh, in ray tracing. But um, you know we're, we're excited for ray tracing. I think uh, I, I personally can't wait for Cyberpunk. I think that game looks fantastic. Um, and I'm excited to use it with the Radeon GPU. You know I think that uh, the performance you get from us in ray tracing is still pretty good. Um, and I think that um, the majority of the games that are out there in the industry don't have ray tracing in them. And so I think that for the fast, vast majority of games you'll play, frames per second is very competitive. And for those games with ray tracing that are maybe out in the market today, um, 
we're good. We're, I think we're, we're competitive, but I think going forward, you'll see us even compete even broader as, uh, as we work with our game developer partners and bring them up on, on uh, the 6,000 series GPUs and are, of course, leveraging our console relationships that are, are just starting now. Got it. And in staying on the, the somewhat related to ray tracing, during the briefings um, for our DNA 2 in these cards, you guys mentioned that you were working on a, um, you know, a scaling and a sharpening super resolution kind of feature similar to DLSS. Any any update on that progress? We know it wasn't going to be ready quite at launch. Any updates you can give on that? Yeah, let me uh, let me talk a little bit about that. And the reason why we we didn't really talk about that much is um, we're not ready to discuss the details of that yet because our our goal is is a little bit opposite of our of our competitors. Our goal is uh, we want it to work across everything. Um, you know, our, our game developer partners, all the game development partners, and including our console partners, they're they're just begging us not to create multiple APIs that are vendor specific and uh, or game implementation only and so you know they don't want to go in game by game and they don't want to you know code for us and then code for our competitors it, it just really slows down the industry and so what they've asked us to do is not create a new api dedicated just for us do something that's open we'll we'll work with intel we'll work with our comp uh, nvidia we'll work with our stuff of course and then we're hoping to make it broad enough that we can work cross platform um, and that's going to take some time um, we we don't want a performance hit we want really good scaling, really good high quality imagery. Um, and so we still have some work to do there. And as soon as we get more uh, you know, information that we could share with you, we're, we would love to and we will. Um, but it's just going to take us a little bit more time because our, the game developers over the last couple of years were, 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 gave us very strong feedback. Please don't produce a proprietary API. It just does, doesn't do anyone any good. And um, it slows everybody down and they have to spend more resources coding and debugging. And, and so our, our goal is... Our commitment is we will have a super resolution technology, but our commitment is to make it open, accessible for everyone. Game developers, if they choose to implement it, it'll work across everyone and be highly optimized so that way they get the best performance and they just need to write the code once. And so that's why you see a little bit of a, a pause that we don't have it available at launch, but it, you know we're, we're diligently working on it, putting a tremendous amount of resources on it, but it's in partnership with our console and our game developer partners. It's in partnership, not, not exclusive, just development inside AMD. Cool. Gotcha. I had so, a uh, question for for Frank on smart access memory and sort of platform optimization in general. I guess maybe I know you can't speak about um, any you know forthcoming products specifically, but what's your vision in that space? Um, in maybe the high level areas where AMD can bring to bear CPU GPU optimization, whether it be smart access memory, software side, just kind of you know exp wanted to explore that a little bit more. Um, well, as you know, I can't announce any unannounced products uh, right, right now. Um, but you know what I would say is we're looking at all of the compute that we have inside um, an AMD-based platform as opportunity to uh, optimize your workload as uh, as best suited um, for that particular workload or that particular uh, moment in time um, and how you're using your PC. So, you know, if you think about um, uh, for the, in the case of our notebooks, for example, you actually have two graphics cards in our notebooks. You have the graphics that's integrated into the APU and then you have the discrete graphics card when you have a, a Radeon graphics card present. That offers us some opportunities um, across a, a bunch of different experiences. Um, when you think about our desktops, you know, smart access memory may have um, you know future iterations and implementations of it that continue to build upon what we've just revealed uh, that can make it even you know more performance enhancing in its capability. Uh, so we're just getting started. These uh, AAA technologies like SmartShift and Smart Access Memory are in version 1.0, each of them. And we absolutely intend to be working on successive versions. We are working on successive versions of them and releasing them in the future. So you know your people's imaginations can go, can run wild as to what's potentially possible and we are likely thinking similarly and, and working on those things and we'll be introducing them here pretty quickly again if you think about it in, in just one year we've already introduced two of these technologies um, and that's with an organization that's really in its infancy it just really started off at the beginning of this year so i, I think you're going to see more steady execution from us moving forward and more of those features that make an all AMD platform the best platform um, in the industry and what it's able to deliver because we're able to harness all of that performance and make smarter use of it. 
Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. And thanks for fielding that. I know you had to tap, tap dance around it carefully. <laughs> uh, Marco, what, I'm sorry. Let's, let's go back to, uh, to the flow there you had going. Um, so I'm not actually sure. There's a couple of questions I've hit the chat on, on Rockham support for the 6,000 series. To be honest, I have been neck deep and I, I wasn't sure, um, what is or isn't supported. Scott, is that something that, that you can address or is that in your wheelhouse? Uh, it is. We'll, we'll make a, we'll make a further, uh, update to that soon. I think that, um, you know, our, our goal is to have, uh, game, gaming today today's gaming um but you'll still soon see an update from us on the more professional side or or compute side gotcha and there was a couple of comments that i saw earlier i'm going to go back i'm kind of shifting gears here we're going to go back to the hardware and design for a second um no external venting on the cooling solution on these cards is that a was that a a conscious decision is that just a, a reality of the trying to pack so much heat sink on the cards what's the philosophy into keeping um you know the triple axial fans with no exhaust if you could talk about that yeah i'll, I'll talk about it and then frank frank could talk about the platform and how we thought about the platform but um and i actually think frank produced a really great marketing video that you guys should check out if you're interested to see the airflow of, of how we thought about all the different designs and the chassis yeah. that this graphics card can fit into, but um, you know, we we modeled a lot of different airflows and chassis that we see that enthusiasts have, all the way from small form factor to um, full tower form factors. And for the most part, uh, we believe that the airflow is pretty good. I, I think that we're we're listening for feedback, obviously today, and as people as gamers get their hands on it, and um, you know, we're always willing to improve. But uh, we believe that the airflow is should should work very nicely in enthusiast chassis. If if there's anything, Marco, that your community taught me last year when I launched the blower card, was that um, don't <laughs> don't sell us short. We know how to cool cases, and so we think that uh, this will work just fine in most enthusiast cases. That um, given the the amount of airflow that they have in there, and what was critical for us. Um, and I have to be careful here because uh, I don't want to dig on them too much. But we didn't want to blow air up into the chassis. We wanted to blow it to where the fans are exhausting out. And so uh, I, I think that we pick pick the right design. You don't have to buy a new CPU cooler. You don't have to go out and buy new case fans or or maybe a bigger chassis. And so all of that mattered to us in this generation. We just wanted you to be able to plug in that GPU to your existing power supply, not have to purchase any more components, have the airflow all just work to what the enthusiasts told us their cases look like. And I, I think the engineering team did a, a great job at that. Got it. Very cool. Very cool. Um, I would like to nerd out for a second, and I might not frame this question properly, so forgive me. I'm operating on three hours of sleep, and my brain is <laughs> melted from, uh, if I told you what I went through to get this testing done, you wouldn't believe it. But so <laughs> looking at um, smart access memory and the Infinity Cache together and the architecture as a whole, you now have, you know, this really powerful GPU with a 128 gig, you know, last level cache, and the CPU can now look into all of the memory on the card. It kind of strikes me that that opens up the possibility for some interesting workloads or workloads that we had that will now kind of sort of fit right in the cache and can be super accelerated for lack of a better term. Yeah, what are, are there any sort of scenarios that, you know, may arise where this particular sort of setup and architecture could excel beyond, you know, what we've seen today in the benchmarks? Hey, Frank, maybe I'll let you uh, take, a, take a run at that first. Look, we, we designed RDNA 2 uh, for gamers first and foremost. Um, I think it's why you see the separation from GCN and uh, uh, what we're doing on the data center side. Um, it's a very efficient chip in performance per watt, um, and it was designed for gamers and for gaming first and foremost. And um, in the future, you'll see you know content creation opportunities uh, emerge as well. Uh, but that's our number one focus with these cards is we're really trying to focus very narrowly focus and it's one of the reasons why we were able to improve the performance by such leaps and bounds over the last couple of generations is because we very narrowly focused on gaming use cases that were intended to go were intended to go after and you know uh, other content uh, productivity work uh, 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 workflows as well um, but you know, right now, I think what you'll see is if there's unintended benefits, um, time will tell. It's not what we've been testing for right now inside. We, we really, I don't think even have a good uh, sizing of, is this thing going to be excellent in some other type of workload that it wasn't designed for? It's certainly possible, but gamers were what we had in our target when uh, when we designed this card from A to Z. 
And can you guys comment? I know right now, um, smart access memory is only available. You know, it's it's new. It's only ha- available on a handful of, handful of boards. Is that something that's going to come to other platforms? We had a chat a question yeah, asking about chat. even going to, you know, three hundred or four hundred series boards, yeah. or is it going to strictly be five hundred series? So, developing the feature um, takes time. Like I said, there's a fair amount of validation work that has to go on and, and coding work that has to go on in the BIOS and the firmware and debugging work. Right now, we know that we can uh, uh, deliver it reliably on 500 series chipsets and on Zen 3 processors. Uh, I, I think you've seen that there's a culture from AMD to, to offer as much uh, backwards compatibility and forwards compatibility as possible. You've seen that with the AM4 socket. You see what we've done here with the graphics card. We wanted it to fit inside existing chassis. We forced it to fit inside a 10 and a half inch card length. That culture hasn't changed. We absolutely um, have you know, the, the intent of preserving as much compatibility as possible. But we honestly haven't done the work yet to on other chipsets. We've had a a lot of other things going on in the business, a few other, you know, launching a CPU, launching a graphics card. There's been a few other priorities right now, but uh, we, we're going to look at it and we'll see if it's going to be possible to do it with any performance uplift and with any reliability. And please stay tuned. Gotcha. Um, go. Dave, I know we're, we're, we're running really short on time. Should we, uh, should we let these guys riff on stuff we probably didn't get to? <laughs> yeah, and, and there's also a, there's also a question I would have kind of follow on to that um, on the software side of the equation, or or really on the yeah, I guess what I would call the gamer environment side of the equation. What's AMD's level of commitment with, with respect to bringing new features and capabilities to the gaming platform? Um, you know, for six thousand and five Radeon RX six thousand and Ryzen five thousand. Any further insight you can share on the road ahead uh, for PC gamers? We know there's lots of new experiences coming to consoles. And just, I, I guess, visionary sort of thoughts there. Go ahead, Scott. <laughs> That's a tough one. Uh, I'm going to let you tap dance now. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, we have a lot of things on the roadmap, um, hardware and software. And I think what's unique about this is all of our CPU and and GPU engineering teams are all in one company, and there's a lot of fantastic ideas. You know, Smart Shift, which is a notebook platform, was our first A A plus A plus A, I guess, AMD plus AMD CPU plus AMD GPU plus AMD software technology that we brought to notebooks. We now have uh, Smart Access Memory. And if you take a look at our roadmap, uh, we're, we're very excited about even more gaming features that we can bring in the future. We'll just have to stay tuned to what those are. <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, I don't know. Um, I, if I could I, add, if I could go add to that, go if, for it. it's okay. Yeah. Um, maybe not exactly uh, uh, a question about the fu- an answer to the future, but an answer to the current would be a lot of people don't utilize the, the capabilities that we already have in the Radeon uh, driver set, the Radeon software, uh, adrenaline software. We have a pretty uh, uh, compelling amount of uh, and comprehensive portfolio of different capabilities and features within the software package that's already shipping on uh, Radeon graphics cards. Um, things like Radeon Boost, like Radeon Image Sharpening. Um, we have our Relib, which is our streaming and video and audio capturing uh, technology and software. There's a lot of experiences already that are, are just kind of sleeping in people's PCs that have Radeon graphics in them. I encourage folks to check them out um, because they may already find an enormous amount of value that's inside their box and they, they just haven't made the time to investigate the software package. The, the adrenaline software package is so much more than just a driver um, and it's a unified software package. You get it all in, in that one software. You don't have to go and download other pieces of software to kind of add modules or anything to it. So I think if you look into what's already inside, what's shipping and how it's evolved over time. We have something called AMD Link, which is really cool. You can stream your your, your AMD PC, your Radeon-based PC to iOS devices and Android devices and play games on those devices, including your TV, for example, if it's, uh, it's supporting those operating systems. Um, so those features have evolved over time. On some of them, we're on versions two, three, four, for example. That'll continue to happen, and you can start to kind of imagine how those experiences will evolve with the, through the software package running on the GPUs and our APUs um, as we continue to iterate and improve upon them. Yeah, 
Good stuff. Yeah, and kudos on on the driver side of things. Uh, plunking around inside uh, Radeon software with the 6800 XT uh, Rage mode, all that good stuff. Myself over the last few days, nice and clean, easy to easy to work with. Good stuff, Marco. What else we got? And uh, and then yeah, we should. I, I want to ask these guys what what are they. What what are your favorite titles these days to game on with a with a sixty eight hundred series and a Ryzen five thousand combined? What are you guys jamming on at home or wherever? Well, if you haven't been paying attention, I had to buy a sixty eight hundred today. Thanks, Dave, <laughs> um, because uh, Scott didn't send me one, so I'm playing on a fifty seven hundred XT right now. Um, but I'm playing a lot of squadrons. I'm having an absolute blast playing squadrons. Um, and I'm kind of taking advantage of being work from home because it's kind of hard to play that when I get back to traveling again on an airplane. I think people are going to look at me a little strange if I have a joystick and I'm trying to <laughs> play um, <laughs> with, the, with the VR headset on. Uh, so I'm kind of enjoying the work from home situation to get uh, some joystick gaming in. Uh, and then once I'm bored of that, I'm probably going to get into flight sim. And our performance on uh, our 6000 series and flight sim is really good. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Nice. Scott, how about you, buddy? Uh, well, I, I love esports games. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I play League of Legends. I love League of Legends. I'm a huge ARAM player. Meet you in the middle if you would like. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think the uh, Borderlands, I'm a huge Borderlands uh, fan as well, Division 2. Mm. Uh, I, like I mentioned earlier, though, I'm, I'm looking forward to Cyberpunk. I think that, uh, you know, I was at that Xbox event where Keanu Reeves came out, and uh, from that moment on, I was hooked. Yeah. Uh, that was a, such a cool gaming moment in the history of gaming moments. But um, there's a lot of fantastic games coming out this year. You know, partners, partner games of ours like Godfall, Dirt 5, just fantastic games. that are really going to push the boundaries of visual fidelity and, um, and experiences that I think that, um, there's a wide range, and and I think that's why you see so much excitement about purchasing GPUs from us in our competition because people are stuck at home. You don't have anything else to spend your money on, so you, you want a <laughs> GPU. And and so now our job is to keep pumping out supply and get get as much supply as we can out there, so so that way people can enjoy their games. Amen. Amen. Sounds good, Marco. Do we miss anything? What else? I'm sure we did, um, but we are we're over time. I know some of the guys had a hard cut, and I don't want to uh, get these guys in trouble. They came on, they interacted with our audience, and you know I want to make sure they come back. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to push it too far. We're not going to do. We're not going to read the mean tweets uh, sent out my direction. That's shit. I mean, I I will. To be honest, I would love to stay live after you guys go to address some of this stuff because it's you know part of it is just so silly, and part of it you know people don't understand how tight this industry is and the conversations that happen between people um, sometimes publicly, and it, it's. I don't know. It's I, I guess I, I lost the cynical thing years ago, and I yeah. just enjoy the industry. I'm 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 psyched that there are GPUs that kick the crap out of the previous gen from both sides. And uh, yes, it sucks that it's hard to buy them, but look at this crap. Look at this stuff that we get to play with in the next few weeks and months as they become more available. It's like I don't know. I don't get the I, I get the frustration, but I don't get all the vitriol. It's I yeah. guess I'm I guess I'm soft. I, no, I would agree with you. You're you're a balanced individual, and uh, well, mostly, anyways, Marco. But <laughs> but I would agree with you. I, That's I a think, stretch. I, I think the uh, I think the criticism is unwarranted in a lot of spots. You know, yeah, sure, it's it's incumbent upon uh, our uh, AMD and you know certainly Nvidia and their shortages as well to deliver as best they can. But demand is demand, and I mean, you know. Uh, the good thing is we all have something to demand now, right? I mean, you know, before, eh, not as much, not as much competition. Now we've got some some great competition and some great options in the market. Well, if more GPUs are on the way, as Scott said earlier, um, and we want nothing more than to put a GPU in the hands of every single person that wants one. We're working very hard to make that possible. Um, and we're going to continue to do that. So you can absolutely count on that. You know, it, it's... Uh, a little bit of patience. We really appreciate the support. Um, really, really do appreciate the support. Like I said, so many years, so many people coming together and working hard. And not just at AMD, but I mean, all of our partners that have, have helped make this possible, our e-tail partners, our retail partners, our AIB partners, uh, the vendors that have helped us make these cards, and you know, whether it be the thermal solution, the com individual components, there's so many pieces that have to come together. And they have. And like anything, right, you, 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 a launch has a ramp uh, of supply, 
Um, and we're in a really interesting market right now that's a good thing for everybody. And we're going to get a card in the hands of people. Um, it's just we need a little bit of patience and we're working, we have our commitment. I mean, this guy hasn't slept in months and I haven't slept much either. We're, we're doing our absolute best. It's, we may not be perfect, but we're certainly trying. I, I assure you of that. I, I hear Scott's working working weekends and nights at the Fab launching wafer starts. Right? <laughs> I hope. Rolling I up your sleeves. I hope not. I hope not. But we have a we have a very good supply chain team that that's helping us uh, accelerate supplies. So, hey, by the way, thank you, uh, David Marco, for giving us this opportunity. You know, we we haven't been in an enthusiast GPU space in a long time, and um, I think that this is this is the new Radeon that you're going to see us consistently execute, put out great products. Um, I think going forward, we'll be doing launches differently. <laughs> uh, I think the industry will be doing launches differently if this is the the new norm. Um, but, you know, you have our commitment to improve and you have our commitment to continue to execute on time and uh, making sure that we're we're reacting appropriately to anything we see in the market and uh, and getting the best products we can out to gamers. So so thanks for the time. And I really do appreciate the opportunity to talking to your to your viewers and and social media channels as you put, propagate this through the internet. So thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, our pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your time as well. It's been a pleasure as always. It's great to talk to you guys. And uh, yeah, good luck moving forward. And um, hit the hit the, the like button, mash that like button, follow, subscribe, hothardware.com, where you can find us on the web, twitter.com slash hothardware, youtube.com slash hothardware vids where you will definitely get more Radeon and Ryzen coverage guaranteed in the days ahead. Scott Herkelman and Frank Azor from AMD. Good to Thanks see you, fellas. Us, guys. Thanks, guys. You too. Appreciate it. We'll chat Great soon. to see you as well. Take care. Thanks, guys.